Hello and welcome once again to another retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. We're going through the year 2003, exactly 20 years ago. Today, we saw WWE Unforgiven 2003 and it came to you from Hershey, Pennsylvania at the Giant Centre on the 21st of September 2003. It was also the sixth edition of the Unforgiven pay-per-view and this one was a Raw exclusive attended by 10,347 fans. The main event was Triple H and Goldberg, of course, continuing what left off at SummerSlam. So, <clears throat> with that, the song is enemy by seven dust and it appears on smackdown versus raw the video game for xbox and playstation along with day of reckoning for the game cube so yes in gaming this was around the time when gaming was pure and you actually got rewarded for playing well rather than having to buy stuff. But you know, times do change. Before we get into the main part of the podcast, I'm just going to go through the result on Sunday Night Heat, the former pre show. We now obviously have the kickoff show. And we see Maven, the first ever winner of the Tough Enough competition, beating the veteran Stephen Richards in the Sunday Night Heat match. Now, not seen this pay-per-view for a long time. It's Unforgiven is one of those pay-per-views that you don't really go back to very often. Um, and if you do, it's... Because it's historical, you know, we don't have them anymore. They finished in 2008. So, yeah, Unforgiven, 2003, we'll be with you in the main part of the podcast after our introduction. This is awesome! This is awesome! And so we start with a title match. It is the Raw Tag Team Championships, or as they were as they were then the World Tag Team Championships. Beautiful titles they are too, exclusive to Raw, and like I say, looking absolutely gorgeous. Um, it is the champions, La Resistance versus the Dudley Boys in a tables match. This is not an elimination tables match either. It is a handicap tables match because Spike Dudley got injured uh, in the build up to this <clears throat> to this match. And Eric Bischoff forced the Dudley Boys into a tag team championship match against Sylvain Ronier, René Dupree and their newest associate Rob Conway, who dressed up as an American soldier, drew in the Dudley boys, hit them with the flag, got buried by the flag and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this is the kind of, this is a blow-off match. So, <clears throat> rules of this match is you have to put all three opponents through a table, or in Lapis Stance's case, two members through the table. It's not elimination like I've mentioned before. However, this match is rather confusing because it starts off as a normal tag team match, but there's no rules, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I suppose that does in way of presentation in terms of keeping the action in the ring for the fans that have paid for the tickets so that they can see the stuff happening. Um, but it, yeah, it started off a little bit confusing. Didn't take long for everything to break down. Uh, Devon and Bubba Ray getting on top. Devon going to fetch the tables at the request of his half 
brother from Dudleyville. <coughs> and it would be Devon who would go through a table in the corner first as La Resistance get back on top. So Devon goes through the table first. It would then be Sylvain Ronier going through a table next as the La Resistance look to clean house. And Bob Array turns that around, puts Sylvain Ronier through a table. So with one each on either side. It is Rob Conway who is victim then of a double spine buster over the top rope through a table on the outside. It is in fact a double table, but takes a rather nasty fall, misses the second table completely and just goes through the first table, hitting his head on the way down, no doubt. And this is why tables matches are so dangerous. And <clears throat> from there, it's now a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's Bubba Ray versus... Uh, René Dupree, obviously all members are in at this point, but uh, there is a table which Devon tipped up to stop Bob Ray going through the table through a backdrop. And it would be then René Dupree going through the table last to give the Dudley boys the victory via a classic 3D. Uh, I quite enjoyed this one for what it was it was rather quick match but that is fine i think it got around 10 minutes ish and uh, yeah it was all right it was it was a good blow off match like i say a bit of confusion at the beginning with the proper tag teaming holding the tag ropes making the tags getting one in one out that kind of thing when there's no rules in the tables match it makes little sense but Apart from that, it was good. And I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five because of that confusion. But nothing wrong with the match. Um, like I say, just a little bit confusing. But there we go. And on to the th second match, rather, of the evening. Third match overall. It is the match between Scott Steiner and Test for the services of not only Stacey Keebler, or, but potentially Scott Steiner as well. And I'm just going to make this one as quick as I possibly can because it is not awful. It's functional. <clears throat> but... I'm just going to gloss over it. Stacey Keebler tries to get involved. Test, state, uh, test chases around the ring. Um, the We then get um, Test coming into the ring with a chair. As the referee is trying to put the turnbuckle cover back on, which Test had taken off. And uh, Stacey steals the chair off of... Test goes to swing it at Test, misses, hits Scott's diner square in the jaw, and Test runs in big boot and a massive thigh slap for the one, two, three. All this whilst Test is staring Stacey Keebler in the eyes and pointing at her. Yeah. It's not a good match. I'm going to give it one and a half cheap shots out of five because it was a serviceable match. It wasn't terrible. It was just a really sort of... It was like a third-party storyline that they had to have a blow-off for and this ultimately was that match. So Test now owns Stacey Keebler as his property. And also Scott Steiner as his property. But before we move on from this match, I just want to do one thing and say how good the set for Unforgiven 2003 actually is. They actually set the logo on fire and it's burning throughout the whole show, which is just insane. 
I love it. I love it. They've got flames at the back and um, a load of stuff dripped off onto the floor. But yeah, I mean, it was over the top. It was completely nuts. But yeah, shout out to the set designers for Unforgiven 2003. Next up, we have a women's tag team match featuring the women's champion Molly Holly going into a tag team contest, not defending her title, with Gail Kim making her pay-per-view debut alongside Molly Holly, the women's champion, against Lita and Trish. And they have a long-storied rivalry that spans many many years unfortunately even though there's three veterans and it could be classed as four veterans even now this match ain't good they were not they they gave it their all they had little to no time because that is 2003 wwe who had little to no time for the women which is a damn shame because you've got some real talent on show here. Reason that Gail Kim came, went and came back and then went pretty much straight away again. However, the other three stuck around. All three are brilliant. Molly Holly, fantastic. Uh, Lita and Trish, very storied. Um, both retired. Trish came back and still around, I think, uh, and doing really well. Um, which proves the longevity of Trish and how well, and I always say this on all of my podcasts, how much time and effort and devotion she put in to become a wrestler from being a valet. And uh, yeah, she became more than just a sex symbol that the company made money off of. Of course, they'd still make money off that, but she became a bit more. On to the match, not much to it. Lita picks up the win via a moon salt or a Lita salt, as it were. Um, I always say this because it, it wasn't a terrible match, but they just weren't giving, given enough time to work the match properly. So that is bad booking, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to give this a one cheap shot out of five. It's not what I want to do, but it's what I have to do because the match was passable. Anyway, let's move on to the next match because this one is an absolute worldie. We've had a lot of hardcore type matches in recent months, stretcher matches, ambulance matches. We've had um, hardcore matches. And now we've got a last man standing match. And going, and obviously elimination chambers and all sorts of stuff. 2003 was a great year for those kind of matches. And obviously going forward, um, we have to have another Buried Alive match. Possibly one of my favourite Buried Alive matches actually. And I've believe actually it could have even been the last buried alive match that we'd see uh, up to the boneyard match anyway um it is a last man standing match between kane and shane mcmahon and um this one is absolutely awesome it 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 does everything it can to put Shane O'Mac over as the fearless youngster and also to put Kane over as the monster. Um, really good. Really, really good. Uh, Shane McMahon comes out wielding a chair, gets the quick start on Kane, hits Kane unprotected with the chair about five times. Um, before he goes down and, and then beats the count. It doesn't take long for it to roll outside and up the ramp, which is where most of the high-octane 
action happens with Kane in control now after taking up um taking uh, <laughs> taking Shane McMahon up the aisle uh no shouldn't be saying that he, he battles to the back where the unforgiven staging is throws Shane O'Mac into the sign several times uh before beating him to a pulp uh, off the entrance staging and uh, then continues clearing the Spanish announce desk off so that he can tip the Spanish announce desk over and onto Shane McMahon. Shane manages to get out of the way of of Kane and goes underneath the platform that the Spanish announce table is on and uh, comes back from behind on Kane, uh, knocks him knocks him over a couple of times, hits him with what I could only see as being some sort of sign and then with the boom arm of the boom camera. Also, this makes the camera smash into the corner of the announce desk and smashes the lens. It makes me want to cry as a photographer. That, But, uh, yeah, it got the job done. And then you got a really cool angle as well. But they carried on using the camera, which is different. Um, Shane O'Mac would pick up a set of wires and wrap them around Kane's neck. Um hoisting him up onto the platform in sort of like a noose type thing and um, goes to finish off Kane in only in what only can be described as a Shane McMahon moment. He climbs up the scaffolding at the entrance onto the sign that is holding the Titan Tron on the left hand side of the stage and jumps off completely misses Kane rolls out of the way and Kane picks up the victory Shane cannot answer the 10 count Kane gets the victory in this one should be noted that the commentators are doing a fantastic job of picking up Kane and Shane McMahon of this and you can't expect anything less from Jerry Lawler and JR because they are the ultimate in announced teams. They are incredibly good. So, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. It is obviously much more involved than that, but if you're looking for some hardcore matches that don't involve people cutting themselves to make people go people gasp, uh, AEW anyone then this might be one to look out for. WWE Unforgiven 2003, Shane McMahon versus Kane in a last man standing match. It is excellent. And I'm going to give this one four cheap shots out of five. Moving on to our penultimate match. It is the triple threat match for the Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship of the World and it is the current reigning defending champion and champion of the peeps Christian defending his title against his longtime friend Chris Jericho Y2J and the ever formidable Rob Van Dam otherwise known as Rob Otherwise known as RVD. It's not known as Rob. It's just one of those things, isn't it? <coughs> uh, yeah, so RVD, Jericho, trying to take the title from Christian. As you can imagine, the match starts out with Christian and Jericho working well together to try and take out RVD. But as with most of these matches and the way they go... Deception comes between two friends and the law of the gold becomes paramount as both 
want to pick up the championship. Christian wants to keep it. Jericho wants to be champion once again. And RVD wants to pick up that championship as well after his massive feud and blow off with Kane. Um, so this match, uh, obviously with it being triple threat, there's no rules. So all three guys can be in the ring all at once. A lot of no rules matches on this card. Unforgiven. It makes sense. It makes sense in the title, really. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Christian would bring in the championship to try and use that as a weapon. And uh, RVD would hit back. Um, he'd come in, try and hit him with the title. Double leg sweep. Uh, RVD would see Chris Jericho jumping up uh, back on the apron to try and get back into the action. A monkey flip into Jericho was on the cards and a quick roll-up. Christian manages to kick out uh, that. Um, so Jericho uh, was still out on the floor. RVD would go up top and try and hit the five-star frog splash. Christian would gain the edge by holding up his championship. RVD would five-star frog splash the championship and ultimately fall victim to the reigning defending champion, Christian Cage, or as indeed Christian, as he is known here, would retain the championship. Moment of note is a rather wicked-looking uh, tower power bomb electric chair thing um, most people go for the suplexes and power bombs these guys go for the electric chair variant it's something that I haven't seen uh, before obviously I watched this pay-per-view when it did first air on on TV but yeah it's one of those moves that is definitely not used very often if at all and it looked absolutely devastating. And um, yeah, of course, that led to the near fall. But obviously, like I mentioned, Christian retains his championship and leaves Unforgiven as the Intercontinental Champion. We're going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Always find triple threat matches difficult to watch. Um, because of the nature of them uh, and competitors being all over the place. But this one was well structured and it did its job. So, yeah, really just above uh, middle of middle of the road and uh, moving on towards being a, a, a full on classic match. So it's now time for the penultimate match of the Unforgiven pay-per-view and it is a tag team match where the winners become the new and permanent ring announce team for Raw. And this is JR. Jim Ross, good old JR, and the King versus Coach and Al Snow. Yeah, this one really does suck the life out of the crowd. That being said, the stuff that the King and Al Snow would, did in the ring was actually pretty good. It was okay. Um, it was a bit of a an old school grap fest um, of a start and then the non-wrestlers became involved um, I'm just going to shoot from the hip on this one I'm going to give this half a star and it's going to get half a star because of the stuff that King uh, yeah the King and Al Snow did um, but yeah the crowd was flat I was flat it went on too long and it would be Coach that would get the pin on JR for the win after Jericho came in and drop kicked JR to the back of the head. Yeah, 
half a star for this one. We then go into the back and Mark is interviewing the world's heavyweight champion Triple H who is looking at the title longingly like there is nothing else in the world that matters. And uh, Triple H tells a, a story about uh, something and says that he's going to beat Goldberg and retire Goldberg. We then get the match, which after the last match is a mild improvement, but it's still not great. Um, obviously, Triple H is nursing a, a groin injury at this point, so um, can't really carry a match. Goldberg is not really a wrestler. Did improve later, but nothing to write home about here, bearing in mind that he is intense, and like JR says, he's intense, he's got the power, and <clears throat> that's pretty much you lot with Goldberg. He's got the strength, the power and the and the intensity. Uh, whereas Triple H is more cerebral, as, as in the cerebral assassin. But this is for the World's Heavyweight Championship. And it is Triple H defending against Goldberg. And after some piped-in music... Oh yeah, I've got to mention that about the last match as well. The piped-in music for the coach and Al Snow was absolutely bloody awful anyway speaking of bloody awful the piped in goldberg noises here from the dead crowd who definitely weren't chanting goldberg at the time which is a shame because that's one thing i always liked about goldberg i liked his entrance i i i was a fan of goldberg and i still am actually i don't i don't mind goldberg he is what he is and he knows what he's doing and he knows how to um, put that across just because he can't really do the grappling stuff doesn't mean he's not a draw now <clears throat> it would be Triple H who would fall foul of Goldberg's power early on and it wasn't until Triple H would take out the legs of Goldberg that he became a bit more involved in the match and, and kept coming out on top a little bit more. I also should mention here that if Triple H gets disqualified or counted out, then Goldberg wins the match, which has been a bone of contention for a long time. Triple H just getting loads of people to run in for him and, and uh, help him win matches. On this one, he cannot. He cannot physically do that. Otherwise, he loses his title. So at least we get that one-on-one. -on -one. And that would come into play. Um, Goldberg could still be counted out and disqualified, etc., etc. Uh, but if Triple H did the same thing, he would lose his championship. So uh, it did come down to a ref bump. Triple H pushing Goldberg into Earl Hebner, who would fall out of the ring. Triple H would then go under the ring and bring out his trusty right-hand person or inanimate object in this case, and that would be his sledgehammer, his trademark sledgehammer. Hits Goldberg on the chin. Now, whether there's a hand in front of it or not, if that was a proper sledgehammer, that would have knocked out Goldberg. And this is no, no reflection on Triple H. Goldberg gets straight back up. Um, uh, like Literally, he does get straight back up. He sells it for a little bit and then gets straight back up. It's like we then get the finish, which is a spear after the sledgehammer shot and a jackhammer as Earl Hebner comes to and counts the one, two, three. We have a new world champion on Raw and a new announced team. Um, interested to know where this one goes actually with the announced team but the match was awful. Um, because it's been 20 years I can't even remember what happened afterwards but yeah I mean as you can expect it wasn't perfect. This 
this pay per view after a, a really good SummerSlam. <clears throat> there was a couple of bits. Uh, the triple threat match was decent. Orton and Shawn Michaels was really good, and uh, yeah, didn't didn't get much else really. Even the championship match at the end was a little bit flat. Uh, but the match itself, I'm going to give two and a half cheap shots out of five. Um, I'm going to give the half because there was obviously no interference and it was a clean win. But it wasn't good. It was serviceable. Um, but I often think these ratings are for crowd noise as well. And the stuffing had been knocked out of them with the previous match. So maybe if the crowd was a bit more into it, this probably would have been a bit more fun. But it wasn't, unfortunately. And therefore, the main event falls flat again in 2003 on WWE Raw. Uh, at this point, SmackDown is by far the superior show uh, to the point where I've recently bought a SmackDown branded hat with the old logo on it because it's awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Not the perfect way to continue the pay-per-views here. Uh, especially with Eric Bischoff changing the the landscape in terms of the announced team um, and, and Jericho interfering in that match like it needed interference. Uh, the championship match, the world championship match was not good. <sighs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend watching this one. But I watch it because I want to and I want to do these reviews for you guys for the podcast and I watch things so you don't have to and this has been Cheap Shot Entertainment Retro Reviews and I will see you next time wrestling fans a goodbye Hiya!